Welcome everybody to our final demo day of 2023. Yay. Uh, we've got an action-packed agenda today and I'm excited to introduce our presenters from the Endress teams and from our PL network companies. If this is your first time attending the Mother of All Demo Days, the goal of our demo sessions is for folks across the community to learn about what other teams are doing and ask questions about their projects. It's an opportunity to problem solve, ask questions and explore new ideas. As we get through today's demo day, I encourage you to share your feedback for presenters in the chat or follow up after to collaborate. Um, so just a quick run through of who we have presenting today. Um, Daghouse is presenting console, your friendly web interface to Web3 storage. Textile is presenting textile network basin, replicating data to Web3 native storage. Polybase is here to demo uh, private USDC transactions with AML compliance via ZK proofs. Lava will demo a modular backend for crypto apps. Uh, there's going to be a recording from Station demoing the Filecoin Station app, and Lilypad's demo is on running AI and ML compute jobs with Lilypad for coders and non-coders. Um, so just a reminder, presenters, please have your cameras on during your demo, and I will have a timer on my screen to keep time. And so first up, we have Alan. Hello, uh, I'm Alan. Um, here to talk to you about web free storage console um and so yeah first thing is uh, in november we launched a new version of web free storage um, it's a big step forwards for the product in terms of verifiability um, and it enables it to take a big step backwards from uh, centralized infrastructure so it uses um public key cryptography um you cans for decentralized auth and dids for decentralized identity um now, the web console is uh, one of the ways you can interact with web free storage. It's what I'm going to demo today. Um, but we also have like a CLI tool um, and a JS client and a Go client on the two. So when you go to console, it will create a key pair for you. This is your identity in the browser. And it's what you'll use to sign UCANs to perform operations like storing data and submitting uh, pieces to Filecoin. And so we use email to share permissions across devices. So um, let me just put my email address in here. Uh, when I click authorize here, um, all I'm doing is actually claiming delegations that belong um, to me already. Um, and that's doing so by verifying that this key pair in this browser is owned by the same entity that owns the email. Um, so we didn't call this login for that reason, since there's no centralized kind of service that we're authenticating against um, or logging into really here. Uh, so let me just click that email and verify, get into the console. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. So all of that kind of, um, I guess, authentication or auth thing is, is kind of opt out outable. Um, you can always export a delegation and import it on another device, um, but it just makes things really, really easy for um, sharing your access to your things um, across devices. So to your mobile, to your laptop, to your big, big computer, whatever. Um, so when, when you're in, uh, it kind of looks like this. Uh, you've got a list of your spaces here and spaces are just places where you will upload or register upload things. Uh, register uploads too. Uh, they have DIDs as well. Um, you can see them lifted here. Um, from here, you can like import a space so you can actually gain access to someone else's space so that you can upload to their, their space um, uh, just by sharing your DID with them. Um, and you can obviously create new spaces. So uh, that's, that's that. So um, with spaces, you can then uh, click in uh, and see all of the items that you've uploaded to your space um, and then just paginate through them um, and just see them nicely, nicely displayed for you there. Um, you can then, if you want to share your space with someone, you can get, if you can get hold of their DID, paste it in there and you can download it. You can, that delegates permissions for other people to, to do it and you can share that with them and they can import it on their side and then they can use your space as if it were their own. And they can also delegate to um, to uh, to anyone they want to have access to that space as well. Obviously, you get to upload stuff. I'm going to go and go into this other test space that I've got here and just upload a uh, a file. I've got a nice 
nice file here, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. <laughs> um, uh, so and I can just drag and drop and that should upload it. Um, here we go, there it is. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, and then, so what is it, L LW7U, I can, should, that should appear in my list here, LW7U, there it is. Um, pretty cool, huh? Um, so what else did I want to do? Like so you can click on these um, and you can see the root CID and then you can just access that data on the gateway of the picture of me. Great. Uh, there we are. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's that kind of view. Um, and what happens when you upload data to webfree.storage is first of all, on the client side, we get your data and um, and transform it into what we call a DAG, and that gets serialized, that basically allows it to be content addressed, that gets serialized into something called a car file, uh, and and the, the that car file, we content address that set of bytes as well. So this is the CID of the car file with your DAG in it. Um, and if you have a big DAG, then what we'll do is we'll um, shard it into multiple cars. Um, and that helps with kind of resumability if you get, you, uh, you upload a, a bunch of things and then for whatever reason your internet drops out then you can resume from where you left off uh, and don't have to start again from the beginning which is quite quite cool um so anyway that's kind of simple simple thing so but the the awesome new thing that i wanted, really wanted to show you was that you can actually click through to any one of these shards um, and see more information about um about its kind of status in in the world of, of kind of filecoin as well um, so the shard CID, as you saw before, just there, but this is the piece CID, and piece CID is kind of equivalent, kind of equivalent to the shard CID, but it's what you would use to refer to your data um, in, in Filecoin. You can see its size, which is pretty small, um, and that's kind of a kind of an issue when you want to get stuff into Filecoin, because actually what you kind of want to do is um, have a big chunk of data to give to a Filecoin storage provider. Uh, rather than a very small thing. And what web3.storage does is it kind of plays the role of this data aggregator where it will take in a load of data and aggregate um, all of these pieces together into a bigger piece that we, we're calling here an aggregate CID. Um, so um, that's that. And then, so we've got interesting, interesting part here is that we've got an aggregate CID. So this is a, a bigger piece that includes your piece that's been aggregated together. Um, it's also got the height here because whenever we refer to V1 aggregate, uh, sorry, PCIDs, you kind of also have to refer to the height as well. V2 PCIDs have the height encoded in them and they're currently in a uh, FRC, which you should, um, I don't know how to it, like vote on or something. I don't know, um, but you can read about it here at, at the very least, um, but they are, they are that. Um, so we've got that listed there, and it means we don't have to carry the height with us all the time. It's encoded in the actual CID. Um, so then after the like the aggregate CID, so this is the CID of the thing that has your thing in it, um, we've got this what we what is called the inclusion proof. So this is this is like a Merkle proof that your piece is contained within a bigger aggregate piece. Uh, and this shows you the direct path from the root of the uh, of uh, of the aggregate um to your to your data and these are the nodes in the it's as a as a piece it's a it gets transformed into a binary tree um but these this is the direct path you'd have to take to reach your piece from the root of this aggregate and so this is the proof that your piece is in that data and um and uh, you can actually use the thing here to expand it out and you can see other elements of the proof that that are the kind of that they used but they are not the, in the direct path to your data um, and like i said it's a it's actually a binary tree so every node here actually has two other children and we can expand it out even further to like further illustrate this even though these these nodes are not um, not part of the proof they are still there um, and and other data is in there but you can see you can get the idea that this is um, an inclusion proof and this combined with uh, the storage providers here which you'll eventually get is what, what um what's called the, the kind of a data aggregation proof and this is another frc um which you can it's frc 58 um which is um really interesting interesting read really, but it's uh it's it, it's all about this proof um, that we that we have here um that we're generating and the 
other awesome thing about this is that due to UCANs, this is how we're getting hold of this information is our service or web3.storage is kind of giving us um, receipts for every operation that happens. So when you want to store something, you sign a UCAN that says, I'd like to store this. And you get a receipt from the service that says, um, okay, you may store it. Here's the URL, put it there. Uh, and then you'll put your stuff there and then you'll say, you'll issue another UCAN that's signed by you saying, I want, to put, I want you to put that piece in Filecoin, please. And then our service will say, okay, we're going to have to aggregate that with a bigger piece. Uh, just wait a minute. And so what you can do is you can check in later and you can actually follow this proof chain or this receipt chain for actions that happen on, as your piece um, is making its way through the aggregation pipeline into, um, into deals. So you can, so when it's been, when, when we've got enough pieces that we can make an aggregate, you'll get a receipt that says your piece is here and this is the inclusion proof. And then once this aggregate makes it into a deal with one or more storage providers, then you'll get a receipt that says, this is uh, this is the data aggregation proof. This is these are the storage providers you can find your data in, and this is the inclusion proof for your particular piece of data. Um, and then, so storage providers here are just listing out the the IDs of the storage providers, but also the um, the uh, deal numbers that, or deal IDs that they're in. And you can take the P uh, the, like the V one CID here, and you can just click through, and um, this goes, goes to Phil Fox, but it gives you more information about the details uh, the um, the deal so you can actually verify that your piece is in, in that deal with field fox as well but also on obviously it's on on chain uh, but just using that here for, for visual visual proof uh and i think that's about all i wanted to cover um and that's good because i'm two seconds over time <laughs> so thanks very much for listening um happy to say giddy gretchen's in the chat because we haven't got any time and um yeah, go and go and check it out. It's, it's really cool. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so next up, we have Dan presenting Textile Network Basin. Um, yeah, so today we're going to walk through just like a brief overview of, of uh, the Textile Network, what we're building, and then show a quick demo as to like how you can actually use the network. So basically what we've designed is like a initial version of the protocol. And in order to interact with the Textile Network, you can use this basin tool. It's a CLI tool that lets you do a few different things. So you can see the various commands on the right-hand side, but you basically start by creating a vault that is like this container for data. You can stream data from existing Web2 infrastructure like a Postgres database or upload raw parquet files. And over time, we'll add more support there. But basically, as you stream this data into this vault, it gets automatically replicated to Filecoin for cold storage via a deal that's being uh, made using an EVM compatible or FEVM compatible smart contract on, on the back end. But so as you push this data, it gets replicated to Filecoin. And then there's also an optional like hot cache feature. So then you can retrieve data even in a, a shorter time frame, allowing you to have like this, you know, full data availability layer with the, the textile network. And then in the future, we'll be adding a, a number of features around just like greater access control. We'll have like a theme of stateless or stateful vaults. So a stateless vault would be something like just purely fingerprinting via homomorphic hashes of all the data changes for that vault. Or like the actual data availability piece where it's replicating to Filecoin, it's replicating maybe to a hot cache layer if you need that data within a TTL uh, timeframe. So just like tries to cover that full Providence, verifiability, and data availability story uh, in, in Web3 data. And then as far as the demo, it's we have one uh, you know, partner that we've been working with a lot just to like really drive some of the features. So WeatherXM has been pushing data to a vault. So what I'll show you is just, okay, like as they're the data producer in the scenario, what can a, a data consumer do? And since vaults are all publicly uh, stored data publicly, basically I can go and fetch the data uh, via like an API or, or via CLI and actually run queries over that data. Um, and just note that like everything that they're pushing the network is from devices that they're um, that are all across the WeatherXM network. So it's like this you know fully decentralized stack in a way. Um, so yeah, let's just dive into things. So on the right, you can see some like simple visualizations of the data. 
but I'll just talk through like the general project setup of like how I use the WeatherXM basin information and and I built a Python script to actually run these queries. And just note like the, the jobs that I'm running are just with GitHub Actions, but I do want to move this to Balcohol in the future. So just keep that in mind. Hey everyone, today we're going to walk through the textile network and basin and how it's helping WeatherXM replicate data to cold storage, but also making that information accessible to external users. You can see the repo here shared in the, the deck as well for that source code. But basically what it does is run a job just through GitHub Actions that'll write data to a summary file, starting with a, like a CSV that stores every job, every run that it has with average and aggregate metrics. And then there's also a data file, really markdown file that stores like a snapshot of information across the data set. So you can see some of the various columns we have there, such as like temperature or wind information, device ID, some aggregate metrics over a specific query range, and then plots of information. And since there's only one run in this example, it shows a single plot, but you could imagine how that gets interesting over time. And just to give you an idea of what this information looks like throughout all, throughout all of the different commands that we just showed or the script itself, you can fetch those vaults associated with an account. So as noted, xmdata.p1, that's one of the vaults that whether XM is using to push data and replicate it to purely just cold storage, but we do have a hot cache feature that I'll touch on in a second. Once we have one of those vaults, we can fetch all the records associated with the vault. So this will give us each and every CID that is associated with files that have been uh, uploaded and when you create a publication. But to describe how caching works, so when you just uh, since I only have 10 seconds, there's also like a, a, a caching feature too. So you can see in this view, when you create a publication or a vault, you can also set up a cache. So you have that high availability, but hopefully that covered things. Uh, sorry to cut things short, but I was a little long there. <laughs> no worries. We can share that out as well. Um, but thank you so much, Dan. Appreciate it. And next up we have Sid from Polybase. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm ready. So I'm also going to share my screen uh, and present a YouTube video because um, we did this demo before and this will be a little bit easier, but we'll be here for, for Q&A um, or you can just uh, email us as well after. Um, very high level, we are presenting Polybase it is a uh, ZK layer two rollup to Ethereum uh, with private USDC transactions. Um, that's the first uh, application we're building on Polybase. Um, and one of the key um, features of it also is that we have compliance proofs for AML uh, using zero knowledge proofs. So you don't have to reveal any of your transaction data. Um, you can just produce a proof that shows that you haven't interacted with any bad actors. So let me share my screen and get started there. All right. Cool. Welcome, everyone. Um, today we're going to do a brief demo of Polybase. Um, Polybase is a layer two ZK rollup for private transactions. Specifically today, we're going to demo two of the most important features of Polybase. The first one is private USDC transactions. This is not possible today. So any USDC that's transacted today is public forever. Obviously, that's a problem for a lot of use cases that businesses use uh, USDC for, including payroll, um, B2B transactions, trade finance. Um, and even remittances for, for consumers. Um, and so we're going to show how we can do that basically for the first time ever uh, on, on a public network. And the second is compliance proofs. So we're going to show uh, a mechanism for generating AML compliance proofs on private transactions. Again, something that hasn't really been possible before. Um, and we have built this network from scratch um, and written the ZK circuits from scratch to be uh, able to do both of these things. Um, Callum, go ahead and scroll down. So just a quick, really simple overview of what's going to happen in the demo. Um, we have two participants, Bob and Alice. They both are going to have wallets on Polybase. Uh, Bob is going to send Alice uh, money, and then Alice is going to generate a compliance proof that proves that she hasn't interacted with any bad actors. Um, we're going to have a Polybase um, node running. Uh, that's going to be both a sequencer and the prover. Uh, and then we're going to roll up to Ethereum, where we have a smart contract deployed for, uh, for verifying the, the proof generated by Polybase. Great. Yeah, thanks, Sid. Oh, you're going to carry on. 
Yeah, okay. Um, and so the uh, I'll just give a quick overview of all the different steps we're going to take. So we're going to start the rollup server. That's the, the Polybase node. We're going to create two wallets. We're going to mint some test USDC uh, to Bob's wallet. Uh, we're going to make a private transaction from Bob to Alice, and we'll see some of the steps that happens when we do that. Uh, then we'll generate that compliance proof. Uh, and then we'll actually ban Bob's address, and then Alice will generate another compliance proof, and we'll see how that fails uh, when Bob's address is uh, is banned. So, uh, Callum, let's kick it off. Oh, cool, yeah, thanks, Ed. So the first thing I'm going to do is start the Polybase server, because the clients will need to interact with that when submitting their proofs. And then I'm going to create the wallet for both Bob and Alice. So on the top left, I've got Bob. So I'm going to create uh, his address. And you can see I've created a wallet here for Bob. And um, this is the address. This address would be similar to a MetaMask or Ethereum address. Um, and this allows people to send money to Bob. It works in a very similar way. Uh, and we can create a wallet also for Alice. And you can see she's got an address as well, which is different to Bob's address. OK, so then I'm going to create some, uh, make some USDC uh, for Bob. Uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to send a transaction to Ethereum. Effectively, this will be bridging money into the network. Um, so it would lock the money in the original form. It would mint it on Polybase and submit that transaction. And you can see I have the note here, which is really just another way of saying it's the transaction that's occurred. We have 100 USDC here, and we have Bob's address uh, here to say who it's from. And then we also have the source address, uh, which is the same as, as Bob's address. Uh, and that source address remains consistent across many transactions. So any transaction that derives from this transaction would still have the same source address. And that's important for compliance, which we'll talk a little bit more about later in the process. Um, so the next thing we want to do is just send a transaction from Bob to Alice. Uh, and this will be a private transaction. So Bob is going to have to create the entire proof that he needs to ensure he's compliant. Um, and then he can send that off to the prover. So to do that, I'm going to say polybase transfer, Bob, and we're going to send it to Alice's address. I'm going to send the 100 USDC. And so here we have the zero knowledge proof being generated. And that's been generated in one and a half seconds. Um, it's really, it's, it's often thought of that ZK proofs are pretty slow. Um, we've worked really hard to get this down as much as possible. And we're pretty uh, proud of being able to get it down to, to kind of around a second on commodity hardware. Um, so, uh, and we've only got a 16 kilobytes uh, size here, so we can kind of send this from a mobile device, a browser, uh, a network bandwidth limited device would be able to send this proof. And this proof has all of the private data mixed into it so that uh, all that needs to be sent to the prover is the proof itself and a hash. So transaction has been added to the rollup mempool, which we can see there's stuff happening over here. I'm going to go through that in detail in a moment. Um, but that transaction was sent to the prover um, and the note was sent to the receiver. So Alice received the note to let her know that that money is incoming. Um, and as soon as it's committed to Ethereum, she'll have that money. Um, um, and I just want to mention something here. Like the, the proof is generated on the client side. And so it's pretty amazing that we're able to generate that ZK proof in on the user's computer, um, on an app or in the browser. And that's what allows us to keep the transaction data actually private to the user, uh, but then generate the proof and send it uh, publicly, like Helen mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so again, now we have a new transaction or note uh, being generated for this new note for Alice or transaction for Alice. It's gone from Bob's address to Alice's address, but notice the source address still remains as Bob. And we can, we keep that, that trace across all transactions. So that will remain as Bob's address throughout any other transfers that would occur in this process. So I have the group, what's the aggregate math kit? Uh, and I can kind of, uh, just want, this is something that we're going to continue to work on. Uh, while that's running in the background, I just wanted to kind of show you the diagram so you've got a high level view of what's happening on the network. Uh, and I can kind of explain where we're up to in the process. So uh, the client here, you can see this client is, uh, for example, Bob. There could be many other clients on the network. All of those transaction proofs are bundled by the rollup prover. Uh, and as Sid mentioned, all of the private data is, is kept on the client. The prover only receives these proofs. Um, that one proof is sent to Ethereum. It verifies that proof. And then once it's verified the proof, it updates through hash. Uh, and that enables all of the people in the network to independently verify that that has happened. So it looks like this proof has gone through. Um, and just to kind of follow this through step by step, uh, we have the proof being sent to Ethereum. We have the transaction of the proof being verified on Ethereum, and we can even look at uh, Etherscan and see the transaction uh, being applied to Ethereum. Um, so now Bob knows, as you can see here on the left, we know that the root hash has changed. We've got a new block that's been created in this new root hash. And Bob's now confident that the note did get sent to Alice, and Alice could do the same check. So let's jump ahead and 
have a look at what Alice's balance, and you can see that the money has indeed gone up over to Alice. And we can check Bob's balance. Bob, we want to show us to check to generate a ZK proof on the client. Check. She checks the compliance, and then she can also generate a ZK proof on the client uh, to prove that that source address or that the transaction or the note that she has is a valid note. Um, and that's done by checking the source. Um, so just to explain that in a little bit more detail, I've got a diagram here which kind of shows what's happened so far. We have Bob minting the note. That note was sent to Alice. Um, and this is the process of her creating and checking the OVAC list or any other list that would determine whether you're a bad actor or not. Um, and she's able to create a proof um, that Bob, this, this source address Bob, was not included in this OVAC list. Uh, notice that she's not checking for Bob. Uh, so she's not checking the note specifically, she's checking the source. And she's proven that the source of this note was not from a bad actor because Bob is not a bad actor. And the only thing that's required is the proof to be sent to either Ethereum or any off ramp like Coinbase. Uh, and they just need to look at the proof in order to know that the note that Alex has is compliant and then they can pay her out her money. Um, so again, we're, we're hiding all the details and just sharing the minimal information that is, this is uh, a transaction that is allowed. Um, and now for an example, let's see what would happen if for some reason Bob was actually a bad actor on the network. We can simulate that process of adding her, uh, Bob to the list. So I'm going to do that. Um, here. So I'm going to ban Bob's address. So now this address has been banned. Uh, if Alice was to try and create a ZK proof to prove that her transaction is valid, she obviously can't do that because the note is not compliant anymore uh, because of the banned source address. Uh, and cool. I'll stop it there. Thanks so much, Sid. Up next on the agenda is Kajemni from Lava Network. All right. So I am Kajemni Karimu from Lava. Very excited to be giving this demo today. Um, just want to explain a little bit Lava Network. You may have heard of it as an RPC provider, but it is much more than that. Lava is a modular backend for Web3 apps. Its modular can expand beyond RPC. And uh, with the phase two, which has most recently revealed new features of Lava, we're really excited because Lava is a whole lot faster and supports a lot more. So let's get into it. We know that Web3 blockchains traditionally promised uh, serverless applications. And even though we have serverless in Web2, Web3 has a plethora of options which do not necessarily yet meet the needs of a truly serverless application because behind the scenes, some of the same technologies are employed to essentially connect dApps to blockchains. So right now we don't really have the serverless thing but we do have multi-chain, many, many chains sprouting up, which are intended to make this more decentralized reality a possibility. And the thing with it is that as new chains pop up, dApps require RPC on every chain. There needs to be some way for these dApps to communicate with these chains. And because there's different chain architectures, different ecosystems, this has become kind of a mess and a difficult infrastructure problem to solve. So more chains means more RPC providers, means more people trying to uh, spin up nodes on these new chains and provide services to people who are building dApps. This is the closest we're coming to serverless right now. More chains, more pain. Public RPCs get launched on small chains. They get overwhelmed oftentimes. And then developers want to build their dApp. So they end up running a node on new chains in order to be able to service that chain and, and, and run their dApp. So Lava Network offers modular data access for Ethereum, Filecoin, and all of Web3. Basic idea behind Lava's approach is there's a decentralized network of node operators. There's open endpoints. We use Specs, which is a modular system for representing APIs and chains anybody can serve. Then Lava Protocol pairs data consumers to nodes and incentivizes node operators to serve these fast, reliable, accurate responses. So this modularism is one of the theories. It's basically taking these building blocks. This is a, a, it's a representation, this is a Tetris graphic. And so these building blocks get added onto Lava, which means from the gateway or the SDK or the server kit, you can actually see these different chains and supported APIs and make calls to them. With the uh, SDK in particular, you can do it in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer way. So it's really great because you can initialize multiple chains with very simple calls and then make uh, calls independent of the way that that chain is communicating. So this is an example with StarkNet JSON RPC. You can see that the SDK is actually initialized here, and then a block number response call is made using lava SDK.send relay. 
This is available on NPM for those who, who didn't see. Lava net slash lava dash SDK. Basically behind the scenes what's happening is it's sending the request to the fastest of several providers that it queries the lava blockchain to find and the request gets sent. So with because I have very little time left, I just want to quickly show something. Let's see. So this is a really cool uh, node application that I'm working on, which uses the Lava SDK and actually have a pre-built example of uh, multi-chain calls with a system called badges. Initializes several of the chains simultaneously. So the SDK right now is communicating and then it gives the results of these calls to various chains. So we see we were able to get block numbers from various chains with one SDK making all these calls, coordinating all the communication, simple interfaces in a matter of seconds. And that's really what Lava is all about right now. It's making this developer experience a lot smoother and a lot more uh, collected. So we're now working with SubSquid to add subgraphs to Lava and making additional advances with Lava Phase 2. Are, we're on the road to mainnet. Mainnet is really exciting. It's around the corner for us. And uh, we've been making big improvements to our protocol and uh, doing a lot of integrations with partners. So we look forward to anybody who's looking to integrate. Check us out at docs.lavanet.xyz. I personally write a lot of the docs, so I appreciate any feedback that comes that way. And once again, this is Lava presenting on Modular Data Access Network for Web3. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. The next demo that we have is from Patrick Woodhead from Station, and this is going to be their demo about Filecoin Station app. Hey, my name is Patrick Woodhead uh, from the Station team, and I'm just going to do a quick demo to show you a bit more about Station. So the first thing you can do is navigate to philstation.app, the website, and this gives you a brief introduction to everything that's going on the Station. So what is Station? Station is a product, an app, that allows anyone to join the Web3 economy. You don't have to have the technical knowledge or financial backing to start running nodes and participating. Uh, all that you need is a computer uh, to get going. And what you do is you download the Filecoin desktop app, or you can even run Station on a server with Station, with Station Core, um, and you can start to simply earn Filecoin uh, in the background for, for Station running passively while you just carry on doing what you do with your day anyway. What's actually doing, we've identified that everyone's computers have got a lot of spare resources in terms of storage space, compute capacity, and also the bandwidth you pay for. And it'd be great if we could leverage these things in the same way that Airbnb allows you to rent out your spare room. We'd like you to be able to rent out your spare hardware uh, for Web3 networks. So it's very simple. You just have to download the desktop app uh, or start running Station Core. Um, connect to the network and start contributing and earning fill in return. There's a bit more in the website. You can just check out the FAQs if you're still not clear or you've got any concerns, as well as um, heading to our doc site, docs.fillstation.app, where you can find out a lot more. So if we head back here, we can also just click download and get going. Now, I've obviously already done this, and so I'm going to open Filecoin Station here. And we've got the onboarding steps. Um, I've obviously already onboarded as well, but I've just reset that so you can see what these onboarding steps look like. Uh, tells you a bit more about Station and what it does, about how you can be rewarded once you set up your Filecoin wallet inside Station, and then it'll be transferred to that wallet once you've participated enough in the economy. So we click through, and then we click on Create Wallet. This is something I've already done, so behind the scenes, I'm just going to reset um, my station connection. I'm going to quit this again and reopen. And it's actually just opened up here in the top bar because station runs in the background so that you can carry on doing your day to day while station's doing its thing and you're earning fill. But I'm going to open station from the top bar and you can see that it shows the number of jobs I've completed as well as my schedule rewards. You can see here also that it's got a few lines in the log table the Zinnia started. Zinnia is the runtime um, underneath station uh, so that we can work towards anyone being able to deploy any sorts of modules uh, to this to this special runtime. And then Spark, which is the first module running on station, 
and Spark is a storage provider retrieval checker, uh, and it checks retrievals from Farpoint storage providers and reports details around them. And we really hope that Spark is going to start um, really improving the retrieval success rate in the Farcoin retrieval market. And that's what we're rewarding station operators for doing. We can also open our wallet. Currently, I have zero fill in my wallet, but once the schedule rewards reaches the threshold of 0 0.5 fill uh, and we do one of our payouts, then we'll see that the schedule rewards will actualize into real fill in your station wallet. And then you'll be able to transfer out that fill to a destination address of your choosing. And over time, we're going to build in features to the app such that that's not the only thing you can do with your fill. You can actually also start to contribute back into the Filecoin network. What's coming up next? We're in talks with a bunch of other teams about potential other modules, both for the desktop station um, nodes, as well as the server side station nodes. Uh, and we're thinking about ways in which we can improve the experience in this app for end users to help them learn more about Web3 and understand how, how valuable they are and the other things they can do to contribute. If you've got any other questions, uh, please reach out, let me know. I'd be happy to speak to anyone. And also, please just download the app and, and get contributing. Um, thank you very much. We have one more demo from Lilypad. And since Ali is on a different time zone, we're going to be playing a recording for her. So give me one second. Uh, I am working on the Lilypad team. We've been building out Lilypad for the last six months or so now. So Lilypad creates this kind of decentralized marketplace for compute jobs. So it enables users to leverage the power of distributed computing uh, without the need to manage complex infrastructures. So this platform really represents a significant step towards like this really open and trustless internet uh, and unlocks the next generation of this internet scale models and applications in the web space, enabling better outcomes uh, for these models. So with Lilypad, we're aiming to provide a permissionless distributed compute network that kind of enables these uh, internet scale computing jobs, uh, and you can do all sorts of cool things with it. Uh, as long as you know how to prompt engineer, you can make features like this too. Um, but let's dig into how we're making all this happen firstly. Uh, so Lilypad's live and running already. Um, under the hood, Lilypad combines this off-chain compute implementation details while providing on-chain coordination and verification. So it's built in Go and Solidity, and it's currently uh, running on IPC uh, at the moment. So it uses its own ERC-20 uh, Lilypad token to pay for services, uh, and it's fully EVM compatible. Um, so how do you use it though? Uh, get on with it, Ali. Well, there's three ways you can use Lilypad. You can use it either from the Lilypad CLI, you can use it from smart contracts, or you can use it from the brand new, a recently released Lilypad AI Studio, which is a complete web interface flow. Uh, you don't need to know any coding to be able to use that. We'll get to that in a minute though. Uh, so firstly, demo time. Let's see what we can do with it. Um, I already have Lilypad installed though. so. Uh, Best thing to do is just try it out. Uh, and our, our first and initial, um, actually, Lilypad command is our hello world of the Lilypad, if you will, uh, is actually uh, CowSay. So I don't know if many of you out there uh, probably have heard of CowSay. It's like a fun little thing. It's got nothing to do with AI, actually. So this can just run on any CPU. Uh, but basically, it's just a fun little ASCII art character. So I'm going to run it now. Um, uh, um, and I've just got my uh, <laughs> terminal a little bit too large to see things there, but this is actually like some ASCII art of Lilypad. So Lilypad is now running on the network. Basically what it's doing uh, is it is advertising that there there is a job on the network. Compute nodes are billing, bidding for that job. Then once the deal is agreed, that's put on a smart contract here. So the deal is agreed. Uh, and then the compute node that agreed to do the job uh, after putting up collateral, um, computes the job and sends the results back to um, the original requester. And there's some parts in there that are checked for that job actually getting run. And you can then go ahead and have a look. So this saves to IPFS actually, but we're also saving to local folder as well to make it pretty easy on the CLI. And if we open this up, we get a little how do you do? So that's the message we put in there. And that's uh, the Lilypad uh, Hello World. 
Okay, so that's pretty cool, but you probably want to do a little bit more than just write some ASCII art. So how about a stable diffusion text to image generation? We're seeing it everywhere. Um, I want to show you how you can use this on our lily pad as well. Now, I uh, used to prompt earlier to create kind of this futuristic kind of hacker girl uh, in a cafe, uh, and I'm going to kind of create a similar one, uh, except for this one I want to have purple hair, so I've deliberately put the purple hair prompt in here as well. Uh, so let's have a look uh, what happens when I run uh, this one with the prompt here. Uh, so it's going to do the same thing, submit the job uh, and uh, send to compute nodes. Uh, someone is going to accept that deal. Uh, that'll then get uh, run on the network and return to the user. Now, I've run this earlier because it does take like, a, you know, 20 seconds or so to run. And this is the image I got for it. Pretty awesome, right? I really love this image. Uh, there's a video up on the YouTube as well if you want to see uh, more. But So if I did want to use a different seed, all I'd have to do, as I can see on the kind of thing here, is I would um, input that as an input to the CLI as a different random seed, and I would get a different image. So, for example... Uh, I did this earlier and I put a different, oh, it looks like this one's finished. Awesome. So I put a different seed in for the same prompt earlier for this one. And I got uh, this kind of purple haired uh, hacker girl in a futuristic suit. Pretty cool. Uh, all right, what else can we do on uh, Lilypad? Well, how about LLM? I'm sure you've heard of ChatGPT, which is, you know, a large language model. So what about running something like this on Lilypad? Is it possible? And the answer is, of course it is. Uh, so if you wanted to do that, we have an open source model called uh, Mistral 7B. Um, deployed to uh, Lilypad as well, uh, which you could go ahead and use. Uh, and to do that, you can just put the prompt in here, uh, Lilypad run, Mistral 7B, that's what you want at the moment. Here I'm just putting in name 10 Renaissance artists. I don't know, I'm sure you can think of something much more interesting to ask it. Uh, but again, this will uh, submit to this global GPU network. Um, one of the uh, GPUs will take on the job and then the results will be returned. So same thing here. The answer, uh, the returned answer here is saved to IPFS and also returned to uh, the user. Um, and again, I have put up a demo here on um, our YouTube if you wanted to kind of go down the rabbit hole a little bit further on that one. Uh, whoops. Okay, so you can do way more than that as well. You could do things like fine tuning a model. So for example, if you had uh, a bunch of Claude Monet's art and you wanted to create a model that no matter what text prompt you put in, uh, it would come out with an image that looked like a Claude Monet uh, artwork. Uh, you could do that with something like fine tuning. So you could submit, say, 30 or 40 of Claude Monet's pictures uh, to a fine tuning uh, kind of algorithm. Uh, and it would fine tune an SDXL, a stable diffusion uh, model, to this uh, to Claude Monet's artwork, for example, or say to your uh, technical documentation. Uh, so it would know way more about your technical documentation, but would still have all the benefits of, say, the uh, foundational LLM model underneath it, as another example. This one's only SDXL fine tuning. Um, and you can then go ahead and run that. So this is pretty cool because you can uh, bring in these images CID from IPFS, train to that model, and then run that model that you just trained to on Lilypad. Uh, so try that out at some point. Uh, in fact, this is pretty much exactly how waterlily.ai, for those of you who've seen this before, uh, runs under the hood. So uh, an artist will submit uh, uh, their work and a model will be trained specifically on that artist's work. And then a user can come in, pay a small fee uh, to generate a stable diffusion image in that user's artwork. Now, okay, so uh, we've seen the CLI demo. You can also use um, Lilypad from a smart contract. So you could trigger jobs, like I've just shown you, directly from a smart contract as well. Now, if you want to do this, uh, the best thing to do is go and have a look at our docs on how to do this. We're going to uh, put some more information in there and I'll put a video up on this soon. Uh, but it is possible to trigger jobs directly from a smart contract or, um, you know, from a front-end DAP using our smart contract interface as well. 
Oh, now, what if you we don't have the model or the compute job that you want to run on Lilypad? Well, this is where you can make your own. Now, this is kind of an advanced uh, thing to do at the moment. Uh, so if you're a dev that likes a challenge, uh, we would love to see some more uh, modules uh, on Lilypad. Uh, so have a go at making your own module and submitting it uh, kind of to Lilypad for the benefit of everyone. Um, now, what if you're the other side of the fence here though, what if you want to run your own node uh, or contribute to you or CPU in future resources to the network? Well, uh, docs for that are also going uh, in 2024. Uh, so check out this uh, kind of bit.ly link if you are a GPU provider and you're interested in, in adding your node to the network. All right, what about the no code demo time that I showed you? Lilypad literally is for everyone and so is AI. You shouldn't need a degree to access state-of-the-art open source models or how to use them for your use cases. Um, so we've actually uh, built out a Lilypad AI Studio, um, which is a web UI. You can see it logging into the app here. So you just sign into your account here with a Gmail or similar. You don't need a wallet. Uh, you can then go ahead and choose one of these modules. And I've just shown you all of these. So I'll say Stable Diffusion, Mistral, which is that LLM model. Uh, go ahead and choose one of them and ask it directly in the web UI interface what you want to know. And you will get the response straight back here. <laughs> this was um, this is the video I made while I was in Istanbul. So that one um, just uh, was a bit, bit interesting, like a uh, rainbow unicorn in Istanbul, Grand Bazaar. <laughs> Uh, so it also could, you can also ask Mistral, you know, some top 10 things to do in Istanbul while you're there and the LLM will uh, give you the answer. Uh, so this is live. You can go to app.lilypad.tech and you can use that immediately. You can, uh, and we'd love to see your creations as well. We'd love to see your prompt engineering. So this is one uh, one of our users made and we'd love you to join us. Come and uh, contribute to the future of compute. Uh, join us in the Backyard Project Slack, uh, backyard-project.slack. Uh, dash slack or you know follow us on twitter at uh, lilypad.tech otherwise i hope you have some fun uh, playing around with ai and ml on lilypad and uh look forward to catching up with you again soon awesome thanks so much ali for sharing who's our final mother of all days for 2023 a special thank you goes out to all of our presenters who made this demo session a success and we are looking forward to seeing more of your guys' demos in the future Thank you, everybody. And I know Molly might be in the call. If you have anything that you might want to say for the last demo day. Um, yeah. I only caught uh, my name because my I was sending it to the wrong headphones, but I'm assuming this is a happy holidays sort of message. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful demoers and excited to see y'all again with some snazzy new demos and and code in the new year we might be um adjusting our our format a little bit to have a little bit more themes so we get some shared humans demoing um things in similar domain areas on a call but it's also been really fun to have the diversity of different things from uh polybase to lava to station to lily pad so thank you guys all so much for this it's been really awesome and thank you to misty for making this all happen great Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day and happy holidays. Bye.